Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Good morning. I'm uh, Patrick Doherty. I'm the deputy director of the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. I think I see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, I'm also the director of the new Smart Strategy Initiative here at New America Foundation, and uh, which is going to be looking at a lot of the topics that our guest today, Cleo Pascal, is, has addressed in her uh, new and, and provocative book. Uh, Smart Strategy Initiative is going to be looking at um, three questions. Is it time for America to start thinking in grand strategic terms once again, the same, same way we did in World War II and at the beginning of the Cold War? 20 years after the end of the Cold War, is it time once again to start thinking strategically um, and thinking about how our economy can once again do the strategic heavy lifting? And if you're thinking about that, if, you're, if that's the question you're looking at, you need to identify what are the major challenges, global challenges, facing the United States and the world. And then you need to align your strategy to meet those challenges. I think Cleo Pascal has really done a lot of good work um, in this book, Global Warring, in identifying at least half, if not 100%, of those challenges that the United States and the world is facing. Um, Cleo you know, writes in this book, and I completely agree that the two big challenges facing the United States and the world are uh, sustainability on the one hand, um, climate change being the big leading indicator that we have a major sustainability problem, but then also uh, the problem of economic inclusion, bringing what some experts say are 4.5 billion additional people into the global, the formal sector of the global economy. Um, those two challenges I submit, and I think Cleo is, is in the same place, uh, represent a massive new challenge to the United States and to the international community as a whole, and to the extent that we can align our own domestic strategy as well as the international institutions and the individual strategies of countries, regional organizations, to that goal, uh, I think we may have a pathway uh, to peace and stability in the future. Otherwise, it looks pretty grim, and I think one of the benefits that Cleo, uh, one of the, the great good works that Cleo has done with his book, is demonstrating how grim that future can be and exactly um, how grim it is right now um, and looking at some of the real consequences that we're facing right now. And you don't have to be Republican or Democrat to accept the fact that this is happening um, and, and, and the evidence that, that Cleo puts in here uh, really shows that regardless of your stance on the science of global warming, um, this is an issue that uh, are, if we don't deal with strategically, we're going to be dealing with reactively, and, uh, and the costs are going to be much higher. So enough, of, enough about kind of this new initiative at the, Smart, at, at the New America Foundation. Let me introduce our, our great guest today, Cleo Pascal. Um, she's currently an associate fellow at the Institute of International Affairs, also known as Chatham House, um, and is a consultant for the U.S. Department of Energy's Global Energy and Environment Strategic Ecosystem. And I'm hoping that she's going to be able to tell us a little bit more about that in the Q&A. Um, she's also an adjunct professor um, at two universities in India, Manipal University and the School of Communications and Management Studies. In the 1990s, she was host of a BBC show and wrote an Emmy-winning documentary series. Um, and she's an award-winning journalist. Her works have been published in The Economist, The Times, and The Chicago Tribune. Um, and this is her book, Global Warring, um, How Environmental, Economic, and Political Crises will, with, will Redraw the World Map. So please give a warm round of applause to Cleo. Thank you for coming. She's going to do her PowerPoint presentation standing up. Um, and hopefully the miking situation will, will, will work. Um, so I'm just going to sit over there. I don't do it standing up. You will just be seeing a lovely podium for the next hour or so. I'll do it that way. Um, it, might, it, it might be worth uh, dimming. Is it worth dimming the lights so you can see the? Yeah, Mike, can we dim the lights a little bit? The slides are much more interesting to look at than I am. As a Canadian, I'd just like to say thank you for letting us win the hockey. We really appreciate that. And uh, yes, you can have our water <laughs> if you keep letting us win hockey. 
Um, are we going to show we just go? Okay. So I'm going to uh, just run through the outline of the presentation. The presentation gives a, a kind of an overview of how I'm approaching the topic. Uh, actually, three interrelated topics, geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geophysical um, change. All three of them are interrelated and combined. And uh, I'll show you how I approach it, and then you can, we can talk about it later. The first is the term environmental change versus the term climate change. I prefer to use environmental change when looking at impacts. I'll explain why. The second is the realm of the impacts that I'll be looking at today. Um, there's a lot of discussion about developing world uh, impacts. The developing world will be affected quite severely, but so will the developed world. And so this presentation will focus almost, primary, almost exclusively on how we will be affected. And I'll show that through uh, physical infrastructure, in particular energy infrastructure, service infrastructure, and the case study there will be uh, the floods of 2007 in the United Kingdom. Uh, that was a real surprise, I think, uh, to how overstretched services in a developed society became very quickly. I'll mention Katrina, of course, but it's nice to have a different example to show as well. Uh, challenges for legal infrastructure, in particular the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. And I chose these three areas, physical, services, and legal, because those are the, uh, those are the, the foundation, the bedrock of developed societies. That's what we expect our government to deliver. We expect them to deliver physical infrastructure, services, and a rule of law that keeps everything kind of in line. So if you can see how all three of those will be affected, then you can start to get an idea of what some of the implications will be down the line. And then, uh, because I am Canadian, I do have to look at the Arctic. So uh, that, will, that will come right at the end. But uh, I'm not going to talk about US and Canada in the Arctic. I'm going to talk about China in the Arctic. So. Climate change and or environmental change and why the terminology matters. This is a scene from, this is a picture from, uh, from New Orleans, from what happened in, in here in the United States. Something you'd expect to see from a different part of the world. Um, and I'll explain why, uh, what happened in the U.S. Gulf Coast has to be looked at in the context of environmental change. First, when we build, we build onto what's already there. If you're looking at why Washington is here, you have to look at the river and the plains and the geostrategic positioning and then understand why the city grew up around this physical location. And you can see that very clearly when you look at defensive fortifications. These are four examples of defensive fortifications from different parts of the world, different periods of history, Scotland, France, Israel, and India. They're all built essentially the same way and for the same reason. They're up on a hill. They look out over a plain so you can see what's coming. Very difficult to attack, easy to pour your boiling oil over the ramparts. Uh, really good defensive positions, but they all make one assumption, which is that there will be a fresh water supply in your defensive fortification. If your fresh water supply goes, what had been a defensive fortification becomes a death trap. And in many ways, we have built our cities in the same way. We have assumed that that environmental support structure that is there when it was built, that was there when it was built, will be there forever. And that's just simply not the case. So here are four very clear examples of where it didn't work out quite as planned. And you don't need climate change to see these sort of impacts. There's a, a landslide that took out part of a subdivision in El Salvador. Probably sold as, you know, at the foot of a lovely hillside, uh, you know, right next to nature. That is a, uh, for the city that I'm from here, the city that I'm from, uh, Montreal, is very proud of its potholes. We have not yet had a pothole eat a whole house, as happened here in New Zealand. Uh, that's what happens when subsidence gets out of control. Uh, subsidence is when you have a, a changing of the underground stability and what's on top of it just collapses. I suspect that's what happened. I don't know if you remember the image a little while ago of that apartment building in China that just fell over. It was, anyways, it was right next to a river, and I suspect the underground system shifted, and it wasn't taken into account. The whole building just fell over. There's a railway, now very scenic. It goes right out into the water in France, a little bit of coastal erosion there. And that's an electrical substation that was flooded out in the UK. 
So these things are happening now, and they're happening in the developed world, and we have good engineers, and we should know that these things are going to happen, and yet we still have these sorts of problems. Now, environmental change. When Katrina hit the actual coastline, it was a Category 3, not a Category 5. It was a Category 5 in the Gulf, but it was a Category 3 when it hit. And it was in a bit of a hurricane zone. Every single red line here is a hurricane that hit the U.S. Gulf Coast in the last 150 years or so. Not a surprise that a city in a hurricane zone might be hit by a hurricane. Why was there so much damage this time? Well, first of all, it's worth remembering how much damage there actually was. I mean, this was a major American city that was wiped out. Uh, and the recovery is ongoing. And because of other factors like the financial crisis, it's been slowed down even more. Um, so what happened? Well, there was faulty levy design and implementation on the part of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. If you want to discuss that later, we can. A lot of it was political. It was a really bad situation. Uh, there was a lack of town planning. They were putting out houses on floodplains. There was this very serious subsidence issue. This is a city in a, essentially a delta, so uh, parts of it were sinking quite rapidly. And there was, as a part, as you know, part of it was a draining of wetlands, extraction of groundwater, inappropriately designed waterways, and you end up with this sort of a situation where a levee, a bit of a levee, is is on an area that gives way, and then when a lot of water hits it, it's much easier to break. You don't need climate change to have these sorts of a problem. You know, if, you, if you stopped all climate change tomorrow and you're still building like this, you would still have these issues. So if you're just looking at climate change and not these other environmental change factors, you're, you're not building a complete defense and you're not assessing the totality of the impacts. Now you can look at climate change if you're looking at mitigation sorts of issues, but if you're looking at adaptation, you need the whole package. <coughs> So the sort of point of that little section is environmental change is affecting and will continue to affect, oops, oh, PowerPoint drives me nuts, human economic political security globally. So this is, this is our problem. This isn't just Bangladesh going under. The causes include a variety of factors, including but not limited to climate change. Oh, we're going to have to do this each time. Sorry, guys. Uh, with population consumption increases, changes in land use, accrual of toxins, the carrying capacity and the environmental resilience of our systems is stretched. So what that means is smaller triggers can have a bigger impact. If you're putting, as we grow, you're putting more and more houses into harm's way, you're putting more infrastructure into unstable areas, bits of your system can get weaker. Smaller changes can have bigger knock-on effects. And the last one. And as a result, this isn't one problem. This is a million different interrelated problems. This, is, this isn't going to require one big fix solution. It's going to require a lot of little solutions as well as some big solutions. The good part of that is that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, and we can build defenses pretty quickly in a lot of different areas. And we'll look at energy infrastructure quickly. This is... Uh, this is for anybody who lived through the ice storm in the Northeast in 1998, this is an iconic image. This is one of the pylons that was taken out during the ice storm, but six million people lost power. Um, I'm going to look at how each component of our critical energy infrastructure is being affected by environmental change. Our energy infrastructure is very interrelated and very global. If some parts of it go down, it affects everything else. This again is the U.S. Gulf Coast in the summer 2005. The yellow dots are offshore oil and gas platforms. The black dots are onshore support facilities. The two red lines are the tracks of Hurricanes Reed and Katrina in the summer of 2005. They did a little bit of damage. Um, this is an offshore platform jammed under a bridge after Katrina. Uh, there were hundreds of damaged pipelines, uh, over 100 platforms destroyed, including Shell's flagship platform. Production dropped dramatically, and that created a spike in global oil prices. Now, this was supposed to be a one-off event, right? Bad year. Well, in 2008, Ike and Gustav went through the area again. You didn't hear about it because it didn't so much, because it didn't hear, create so much onshore damage. It created some offshore damage, but by this point, the insurance industries had kicked in. And they were shutting down platforms preventatively 
to, uh, you know, be for insurance issues. So you're getting the disruption to supply without even the physical impact now. And again, this has the potential to affect global systems. A lot of our uh, critical systems are very low lying. You know, Rotterdam, Saudi Arabia, they're basically at sea level. Right? They're port systems, and so as a result, it's logical for them to be there. And they're being affected. This is the Jamnagar refinery in India, one of the largest in Asia, knocked out by flooding in 2007. When you design a hydroelectric installation, you take a look at the last, if you're a good engineer, you look at the last 50, 100 years of precipitation patterns, river levels, glacial melt, and then you design to maximize that. The last 50, 100 years are telling us nothing about the next five to 10 years. So as a result, what you're getting is precipitous drops in the ability to generate hydropower. In India, it was uh, close to 9% or over 8% in 2008. Last year, it was over 12%. And if you're looking at an economy like India, if they're not getting hydro, that means they're going into the international marketplace to secure supply, or else they're looking at other forms of energy supplies as well. Uh, nuclear and coal. Nuclear is interesting because it's sort of, you know, being, it's being discussed quite widely as a potential solution for these sorts of problems. The issue with nuclear is, it, well, one of them, is it requires a lot of water. And they're very long-term builds. A nuclear facility is on a site for minimum 100 years from design to decommissioning because of the time it takes for the reactors to cool. So it's either on the coast, which means it's subject over a 100-year period to sea level rise, storm surges, changing coastal geomorphology, those sorts of issues, or they're on a river. The river ones are having problems already because uh, you, need, you take in the river water, you cool your plant, and then you discharge it into the river system. During hot summers, what they're finding is the water itself is already warmer. The ambient temperature in the react in, the, in sort of the facility is hotter. Demand is increasing because everybody wants to air condition, and you have limits on the temperature with which you can it, you can discharge back into the system. As a result, in the summer of 2003, France had to power down or shut off 17 of its reactors. It costed 300 million euros to buy from neighbors. Supposed to be one off, right? Happened again in the summer of 2006, happened again in the summer of 2009, and poor France, they had to buy power from the UK. It was extremely humiliating. Uh, and renewables aren't immune. Now, a, a lot of these things are design issues. If we design these new variables into the facilities, we can avoid some of these problems. But we're not doing it. You know, it's great to build a solar array, but maybe don't build it in a flood zone. This is a uh, solar-powered factory. You can't actually see the panels, which are, I think, sort of down around here, because they're underwater. They did, in fact, build a, a solar-powered factory in a flood zone. I was like, I was thinking in my head, you know, this is a, a silly example, you know, whatever. I, I'll just, I'll put it up, and then I kind of Google to see whether I could find any images. There are like all these images of underwater solar panels. It's kind of amazing. Anyway, so. The point is, uh, in, in part of this section, is when we're looking at our, uh, at our future, our economic future, there's a lot of focus on growth. But we're entering a period, especially around energy systems and everything that's reliant on energy systems, which is our entire developed economy, where limiting loss is going to be as important as promoting growth. Okay. Very quick look at service infrastructure. This is uh, uh, the what became the island of Tewkesbury during the floods in the UK. Normally, this is a lovely rural village, countryside village. Um, one of the reasons I use this image for this presentation is because um, you can see this is quite an old town. So if this was a persistent event, it's very unlikely that they would have continued the town in this area. So this shows that there, there is actually something going on there. The dates of the, we just finished the last Olympics, so let's look at the next one. The dates of the upcoming UK Olympics start on July 27th. The uh, big floods two and a half years ago in the UK ended on July 26th. Okay. This is, uh, London was not badly hit, but uh, one thing that did happen was the London Victoria tube station was flooded out. Now, again, the London transportation system, like many things in our developed economy, is 
is very interrelated. Parts of it goes down and you get a cascading effect. Victoria goes down, you have a problem throughout the system. Again, it was supposed to be a one-off, right? And again, it flooded out again this last July as well. So 2007 wasn't a one-off. And it's worth remembering that London was not badly hit. However, it still had multiple tube station closures, disruption to rail, flights were canceled, sewers backed up, roads were flooded. Part, part of one of the main rotor, motorways gave way. Uh, the military, and this is sort of the key issue for this section, the military was very heavily used throughout this entire operation. And they were used outside of London. These are the areas that are affected. You can see sort of all pulled away from London, and it was a rolling flood. It was all throughout June and July. And you end up with quite a lot of people affected, widespread lack of water and power. It was expensive. But the key bit is both the fire union and the RAF had their largest peacetime mobilization in history. So if you have this sort of an issue going on at the same time as a uh, a little bit of an Olympics and the need for security there, you can see your security system stretch pretty quickly, pretty fast. This is the Olympic site. It has lovely water features. Um, it's between two rivers. These are the two rivers. It's at the edge of the Thames and it's at the foot of a valley. So there'll be a lot of aquatic events, I expect, during, during those summer games. Um, Legal infrastructure. Now, this is the famous UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. Very important, very interesting document. We're only going to look at one component of it. And it's going to stand in, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, for all legislation, regulations, and subsidies. Basically, the important bit is you have your coastline, and you get 200 uh, miles exclusive economic zone off your coastline. Well, that, that makes one big assumption, which is that your coastline's not going to change. So if you have a nice blue rectangular country and you get your 200 miles and you have a bit of flooding and you retreat, does your exclusive economic zone retreat as well? Environmental change of this sort was not included, uh, was not included in how this piece of legislation was put together. The way it works now is you put your map in, and if your map is accepted and not challenged, those are your borders. It's the not challenged bit where things can get pretty nasty pretty quickly. The question is, will this become geopolitics because of the failure of international law? I'll show you some of the ways that could play out. If you have an offshore island, that deviates your border. Here's some little islands deviating the Kenya-Tanzania border. Well, if those islands disappear, will that border go straight? This was an issue recently uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. This was a news story from uh, September to, uh, 2009. Mexico uh, was using one of those islands in the Gulf of Mexico to extend its claim into quite hydrocarbon-rich waters by about 55 miles. And uh, they had this island on maps for centuries. And they put in, they made their claim, and the U.S. said... Uh, show us the island. Mexico went out to go find the island, and there was no island. And so Mexico said, well, clearly the CIA blew up our island. <laughs> and uh, the U.S. said, well, tough luck, no island, no claim. Now, no island, no claim might be a stand that they regret <laughs> as islands start to uh, become more vulnerable. I'll show you why. We have to do, do a very quick bit. The U.S. is not a signatory to the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea, although in many cases it's considered customary law, and a, a, a lot of very important groups, including the military, would like to see it signed into law. Um, but many of its principles, like this one, of equidistant border, are incorporated in bilateral uh, border agreements. So if, you've got, if you're sort of 80 kilometers apart, sorry, I'm speaking Canadian here, um, and you sort of split it 40 kilometers each side, fine. Well, what happens if half of one country disappears and the, and the other one stays the same? Do you reapportion your equidistant point? Well, let's, I'll show you what that could actually mean. This is the U.S.-Cuba maritime border. This is the equidistant border here. Uh, sorry. Um, Cuba is relatively mountainous. So you get some beaches, but then it goes into mountains. 
the U.S. side has used as its baseline the Florida Keys. Now, the Florida Keys are uh, they're, they're very beautiful sandbars. Right? And then if you go up into Florida here, very beautiful swampland, National Park, in fact, not the Everglades National Park. So it won't take a lot of sea level rise for that entire southern part of Florida to be very severely affected. Now, technically, obviously, we're running through a kind of scenario exercise just to show how faults in the law can, can very quickly become something totally different. Um, if your border ends up around here, and you keep with your equidistant principle, that puts the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico in Cuban territorial waters. Now, obviously, Cuba's political situation will have changed by then, God willing. Um, but Cuba also isn't just Cuba. C you know, the, the Russians are right now drilling for oil in Cuban waters in the Gulf of Mexico. So if big money starts to come into play and you've got confusion in the law, then this is not a great situation. Where this is more likely to become uh, of, of immediate concern is in the South China Sea. The South China Sea, again, an area very rich in hydrocarbons. Uh, these, are, these are little islands all across the South China Sea, sort of about, some of them are about that size, um, which are used to anchor, in some cases, 200 mile exclusive economic zones full of oil and gas. Right? So up to, you've got up to six countries playing in this region right now, and they're playing hard. This is a Chinese military base. Those two very unfortunate fellows are, uh, <laughs> are safeguarding the future of the uh, oil and gas supply of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but it won't take a lot of sea level rise, obviously, for that to become like a naval base, really. And you can build on top of it. But if you build on top of it, according to the law, you only get a 500 meter safety zone. You don't get the 200 mile exclusive economic zone. So then you get into questions about you know, what is an artificial island. And there's, a, it's not, there's a lot of confusion. And it becomes really critical when you start to look at countries that are barely above sea level to begin with, entire countries. And we've heard about them, places like Tuvalu or the Maldives. It's worth taking a look at actually how low-lying they are. This is the main island in Tuvalu. This is the, uh, this is the airstrip here. They are, in some cases, maximum two meters above sea level, six feet above sea level. Well, what happens when they completely disappear and have to be evacuated? Do they cease to exist as a country? Do they lose their seat in the UN? Do their waters become international waters? Now, these countries are presented as small countries because they have small populations. But because they extend over quite large spaces in the ocean, they have large exclusive economic zones and are often very geostrategic. So Kiribati, which is also made up of atolls like you saw with Tuvalu, stretches in the Pacific. These are exclusive economic zone maps. Here's Kiribati there, there, and there. Combined, it has an exclusive economic zone about the size of India. If it disappears and you have a reconfiguration in the Pacific, you have uh, some very serious problems. You can see it in a, in a kind of one-off situation here in the Maldives. The president of the Maldives is very eloquent about his country disappearing. Um, and he is looking for resettlement. And one of the places that he's looking to is India. <coughs> now, there are questions. You know, if India takes it, sorry, this is the Maldives here. This is uh, the uh, Chagos Archipelago, which is a UK-owned US military installation, extremely geostrategic. It monitors the entire Indian Ocean and the entrance into the Persian Gulf. It is very low-lying. During the tsunami, they scrambled the planes and just let the water wash over because it was affected. And there's a question about how uh, US basing might be affected by some of these sea level rise issues. And if you're interested, we could talk about that later. But now the question is, what happens if the Maldives disappears? Well, if India takes in that population, they might have a case for saying they would extend the Indian e exclusive economic zone to include the Maldivian one to administer the resources there on behalf of the new refugee population. So the 
fisheries licenses, the seabed claims, those sorts of things, which would help fund the refugees, but it would change the geostrategic equation in the Indian Ocean. And that's what we're starting to see. Because the international law does not cover these issues, you're starting to see more bilateral solutions happening outside the purview of the law. Not a great situation. Uh, I use the unconventional law of the sea because it's dramatic, but you, I was surprised at how many pieces of legislation, subsidies, regulations assume a physical status quo. Water sharing agreements. This is a real problem in the Western United States. Fishery sharing agreements. Uh, it's a serious problem in the EU. The fishery sharing agreements assume that the same fish will be in the same location pretty much forever. Nobody told the fish. Uh, Hydropower sharing agreements are basically the same issue as water, power, water sharing agreements. The assumption is you get the same flow and so you can apportion it the same way forever. But the water levels are changing so dramatically, both the freshwater supply as well as the electrical supply is shifting. In the U.S., you have issues like the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, the way the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is, fu is funded and used. A lot of different key pieces of legislation are going to be affected. So a failure of legal infrastructure could be as problematic as a failure of physical infrastructure and all the more tragic because it's totally unnecessary. It's just a failure of imagination on the part of the people who drafted it. This is the last section in the Arctic. This is a, a map of the Arctic from the top. It's very colorful and very cross-hatched because these are the overlapping claims. That's normally what gets into the news. Uh, we're not going to cover that. That's very well covered. Uh, most of the confusion comes from uh, uh, changes uh, or sort of incomplete mapping of the seabed. That mapping is happening now. A lot of these issues will be resolved. So not going to look at it. What we're going to look a little bit more at is what's happening on land. Um, there's a big focus on the opening up of the sea ice, and there, there will be interesting and complex issues that arise because of that. However, the land is becoming increasingly problematic. This is what happens when you get uh, thawing permafrost. Your railways, this, you know, this used to be a nice straight rail line. It's now a bit more of a roller coaster. That was never a nice building. That's a sort of Soviet Siberian building. But uh, now I think it's basically just a facade. Um, most of the infrastructure in the, in the north is built right onto the permafrost. So any of your support facilities are going to have problems, and much of your energy infrastructure is going to have problems. This is, again, a view from the top of the Arctic. Um, the, the blue lines are electrical transmission lines. The yellow lines are pipelines, including the pipelines that are feeding Europe and the Alaska pipeline. The black spots are areas that are at high risk of permafrost thaw by 2050. A pipeline and electrical transmission line is only as good as its weakest point. So if you have uh, unstable ground under your pipeline, you're going to have potentially delivery problems. And you can see there are quite a few black spots on the map. And there's also, this is, I don't know if you can see that, but the, the red bit is a nuclear power station. It's hard to see because it's right on a black spot. This has the potential to completely shift uh, geopolitical alliances in the region. Uh, if, if Russia can't, if, if the pipelines in Russia, which are already very unstable because they're poorly maintained Soviet era infrastructure installations, um, become even more unstable or, or more expensive, what you might end up seeing is a shift to more tanker delivery. So instead of relying on a 5,000 kilometer long pipeline east-west, you might end up with shorter spur lines up to the increasingly open northeast passage, which would lead to more shipping, which would lead to more flexibility in delivery, which means that instead of just turning off the pipeline to uh, recalcitrant neighbors and lose the revenue stream, you can cut people off and sell to someone else and still gain still maintain that revenue stream. You can play individual countries off each other, France versus Germany, for example. Um, you can cut off Europe and, and supply Asia. You know, you have a, a whole different, more flexible system. And this dovetails this sort of new, and, and Russia's very aware of it, and they are building up that infrastructure. And it dovetails with another interest in the Arctic from kind of a new player in the Arctic, which is China. 
China's often overlooked in an Arctic context, but they're very active in the region. They have Arctic and Antarctic research stations. They have an icebreaker. There are a large number of Chinese nationals working in Siberia, by some estimates, two to three million. Um, so they are developing expertise at working in the Arctic. They, ha they are networking into local Soviet political infrastructure. And it makes a lot of sense from a, from a Chinese perspective. This is an area that, that has water, potentially agriculture, oil and gas, and it's a toehold into the Arctic. And they're not, the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party is not limiting itself to looking at Siberia. They are actively courting Canadian Aboriginal leaders as well. And uh, this is very telling. There was uh, a big delegation of about a couple dozen Canadian Aboriginal chiefs that were brought out to Beijing on a trade mission. This is uh, this sort of just a, a little window into looking at how China is looking at the Arctic through this one exchange and what that could mean for North America. These are some of the quotes from that, dele from that delegation. Chief Helen said, and this is accurate, Canadian Aboriginals own or control about a third of the Canadian land mass. Through, this is through land claims. And they went to Beijing to tell China that Aboriginal Canada was open for business. He also said that the biggest source for uncertainty for developing natural resources in Canada is Aboriginal land claims. If Aboriginal people are your partners, that uncertainty disappears. That's also accurate. A different chief said that the trip was an important step for us in moving forward. Our future is not only in Canada, but in partnering with other countries. Just uh, this sort of new sublateral type of relationship where uh, the Chinese government by bypasses even bilateral arrangements and goes right to sub-national groups that have quite a lot of power is something we've seen China do elsewhere. And it dovetails with existing stresses in the North. You know, there are problems be with relations between Aboriginal Canadians and the, f and the federal government, and especially when it comes to natural resource and land claim use. This is fertile ground for this sort of a relationship. This is a very diplomatic sentence. Some third parties know this and are not adverse to profiting from the occasional lack of unity and legitimate historical resentment. We've had, I mean, it's worth, it's worth mentioning, you know, the way the Canadian resources are being used now has already resulted in pipeline bombings. We've had six, pi un, un, we've not been able to find them, six pipeline bombings in the last year, year and a half. There's a lot of discontent in the Arctic about the way resources are being used. So it's vital that when it comes to choosing who gets to do business in the North and how, national governments, and this includes the U.S. government, partner with and are attentive to the needs and wants of the people of the North because it, it, there's a lot of talk about exploiting the North, but it's not so clear who's going to get to do that exploiting, and, and I wouldn't take anything uh, for granted right now. So the end point is, in order to truly understand the geopolitical and geoeconomic, we have to understand the geophysical. A lot of this about sort of China in the Arctic is made a lot easier because of the geophysical changes, which would allow a Chinese sh shipping fleet, for example, to come into, through the Bering Strait into the Canadian Arctic and get supplies in and out a lot easier. It's no longer enough just to look at our impact on the environment. It's what we've been doing. We must now also look at a changing environment's impact on us and act accordingly. And if you want more cheerful news, you can go to the website. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Cleo. I think we'll just stand up here and do some Q&A. Okay. Um, and Mike, do what you want to do with the lights. Uh, um, turn this off. There. Great. Um, I'll take a stab at the first question. Um, you know, you, you, you prefaced your comments by saying that really um, you don't have to um, – calculate in climate change so much to be really concerned about what's happening in environmental change. Yes. Um, how would you, um, though, uh, describe the difference between kind of environmental change that we're seeing now and a moderate case scenario where you have, you know, good-sized climate change? What are we looking at in terms of what we need to deal with now versus what's coming probably down the pipe? How would you, how would you make that distinction with well, it's a bit of a it's a bit of an of an artificial distinction because they compound each other. So, if you have uh, 
I mean, a situation like uh, Vegas, for example, is an interesting one because this is a major economic center that's built in the desert. I mean, it doesn't have enough water, right? So um, that would be the major environmental change, which is you put three, four million people into the desert without sufficient planning for their water supply. At the same time, you're, you have 10 years of drought in the Colorado River system. So that water supply is drying out. So they're looking for aquifer to supplant them. So they will drain out the aquifer. Now, draining out the aquifer isn't directly a climate change issue, but you will not have that reserve bank anymore. During so it becomes is, is this sort of self-compounding problem where you just stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch until you've, you've lost your stability and suddenly you just can't keep going. Right, right. So a similar case would be um, Southern California, where they're adding, I think it's about 300,000 people a year for the next 20 years, 6 million people, essentially a small town or a small city every year, and they're stressing the resources. That's going on regardless of climate change. Climate change That's is right. going to make everything worse. That's is what, is what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, and in some cases, um, climate change is often described as a threat multiplier, which is, part, which is an important part of the equation, but it also can create entirely new problems, as we see with disappearing, entire disappearing countries. Right. So um, my, my concern is just that, especially if you're looking at an adaptation process in the U.S., um, not just to look at climate change. Climate change is really important, and it is having a very severe effect already. Um, and what it essentially does is give you more extremes. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I was just in Louisville. In the last year, they've been hit by a flood, a hurricane, and an ice storm. I mean, that's like biblical, right? But it stretched the city budget, you know, and they could maybe handle one, but what are they going to do next year? Mm -hmm. I mean, are they going to put all of their uh, electrical transmission lines underground in case there's another ice storm? Are they going to redesign their building codes in case there's another hurricane? These extremes are happening now and will continue. Right. Could you talk a little bit more about the strategic implications of competition over water, freshwater resources? Yeah. Um, you joked at the beginning that uh, as long as we continue to allow Canada to win the uh, the, the Hockey Olympics, um, that we can have your water. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, and, and, and uh, maybe we can make a trade for um, the, the Canadian side of the falls. But um, <laughs> could you talk about um, how water, I'm, I'm think specifically thinking, like, thinking about China, India, yeah. um, Central Asia, and the, the, uh, looking at sources of the headwaters for this and, and the, the amount of glacial melt, those kinds of issues. How is that going to play out? going forward in terms of uh, changing security dynamics? It's a, it's a critical issue. Um, it's been interesting to, I do a lot of work out of India, and it's been interesting to watch how this discussion has changed in India. Um, China has been very, I mean, for, for those who don't know, the, um, the Himalayan system, particularly Tibet, is the headwaters for, uh, by some estimates, 1.5 or 2 billion people all throughout Asia, including the Mekong system and the Ganges and some <laughs> critical water systems. And China has very severe domestic water supply issues mm -hmm. and has been talking openly about diverting some of those waters uh, for Chinese use. Obviously not very popular with the neighbors. There was a request very recently for them to release more water into the Mekong system because it's not just drinking water, it's hydroelectric power, it's irrigation, all those sorts of issues. And you are, you are getting glacial melt. You're also getting these real serious changes in precipitation patterns. The Indian monsoon is becoming less predictable, those sorts of issues. What's happening, you know, China has, has, has been aware of this for a very long time. And in fact, I would argue that the one-child policy is essentially an environmental adaptation policy. Hmm. You know, they took a look at available natural resources and said, we, you know, we cannot support a growing population. And I think it was a very defensive policy. We we're going to reduce demand. Uh, but at the same time, they very rightly went out to try to secure supply. Right? And uh, so you see a lot of movement into places like Central Asia, Siberia, uh, neighboring Asian states, in order, and Africa and Latin America now as the reach extends uh, to uh, have more secure supply lines for needed food supply, those sorts of issues. China's, China's been very clear on that. And if you look at the leadership, a lot of them are engineers. Hu Jintao is a hydrological engineer. And there's a real nuts and bolts awareness mm -hmm. of these issues. Mm -hmm. In India, uh, India's been a bit slower to sort of look at the geostrategic implications. Um, 
but they are now. I mean, people you'd never expect to talk about water suddenly talking about water. Mm -hmm. um, but what's happening is it's going, it's not being treated as a separate issue, it's going into the general mix. So if, if you have a, an India-China border negotiation, uh, there'll be discussions about the Tibetans, about the actual delimitation of the border, maybe relations with Pakistan, and also water. So it's just gone right into the geopolitical heartland, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Okay, let's open it up for Q and A. Um, there's a, I think Kaylee's got a, a microphone, so if you could wait for the microphone, um, we'll start up here. Um, if you could state your name and then uh, ask your question succinctly, we've got a. Uh, we're on. We're streaming over the internet, so that'd be great for our audience out there. Um, yeah, my name is Josh Meyer, and um, in your book you talk uh, very. It's very interesting. You talk about how China uses the uh, securing of of um, you know minerals and water and things as an instrument of state policy, um, and how other countries don't. Can you go into that a little bit more? I mean, uh, that seems to be something that's going to become increasingly uh, controversial and conflict ridden in the future. Yeah, um, it's it's very interesting. I mean, the we we have set up this kind of international market based system, um, which treats things as as tradable commodities. Um, but the, but our focus, economic focus, has been very short term, and that's affected how we relate to the buying and selling of what are essential goods. Um, China has approached this differently. Uh, they've looked at something like a, a critical natural resource, um, say food, and looked at it not just for its kind of off-the-shelf value, but its strategic value as well, and its value for creating stability domestically, those sorts of things. So the economic structure with which they go into the resource marketplace is very different. Um, you know, China's willing to take what we would think of as an economic loss to secure a supply that they think would have a domestic strategic advantage in other ways. Um, this, this gives them uh, and, and, it's, and it's not just natural resources. If you look at things like trade routes, uh, they, what happened with the Panama Canal was really interesting. Um, the U.S. fought three wars over the Panama Canal. And, uh, and then the Cold War ended, and we won, right? So uh, gave it back to Panama. Panama put it up <coughs> for tender. And the company that got in the lowest bid was... Uh, Chinese government-linked port management company. Happens to be the same port management company that, con that controls or manages many geostrategic ports around the world. And I would contend that it's not an accident mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they got in the lowest bid because mm -hmm. <coughs> the way that they look at, at having that sort of strategic leverage is very different. So their cost analysis would be very different. Mm -hmm. So there's natural resources at play, water at play, those sorts of things, but also geostrategic footprint yeah. in other uh, areas as well. Can you contrast the, that Chinese approach to dealing with this with a European approach, if there is a single European approach, mm -hmm. and looking at kind of how these various issues, strategic minerals, um, strategic access to strategic resources, um, is being played out in the European uh, realm? Is Brussels thinking... Uh, is Brussels using the same tools? No. Is Brussels thinking about it? Yeah. <laughs> um, or are national governments thinking about it separately? Some national governments may be looking at certain components of it. So um, you, can, you can see it a little bit around energy infrastructure. So Norway, for example, is keeping relatively tight control over its uh, offshore gas. The UK didn't. Yeah. Right? So you can, you can see sort of when you look at geostrategic um, or key economic assets, uh, how they're being handled, that gives you a good indication of the general philosophy of that governing or mm -hmm. economic system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it varies. You, know, you see Russia, for example, going more towards this model of uh, nationalistic capitalism, where uh, capitalistic levers are uh, subsumed to a national, uh, into a national agenda. Uh, you see it, obviously, in places like uh, Venezuela, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. But we are really not playing it very well. And it's making it hard in places like Africa, you know, where we want to see quick short-term returns. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're being outmaneuvered by countries that have a longer-term uh, right. outlook. Now, in contrast, Europe seems to have a much, more emphasis, a much greater emphasis on efficiency 
and and yeah. kind of and resilience. Um, is that conceived of as an alternative to an aggressive kind of securitization of these resources, or are they just really not thinking about this at, at, in the same in the same low? <coughs> I work a lot in the UK, and the UK has been. Uh, very vocal on climate change as a security issue. And they've done a lot to put it on the national agenda. But when you look at what they're doing domestically, you, you can see that it, they actually, the, the message really isn't being implemented. So uh, I had a discussion with some of the uh, Olympic uh, security people about flooding and asked, what are you going to do about flooding? And they said, well, what we did was we took the uh, electrical boxes from the bottom of the fences and put them on the top of the fences. <laughs> so that's great, but that assumes the fences are going to hold, right? So there's a sort of a bit of a lip service being paid right. to, to this, but there isn't really an integration, mm -hmm. as you see in China, for example, into the way things operate. Right. But even on efficiency, again, the UK is a, a world leader in kind of low carbon economy discussions. But British government buildings emit more carbon emissions than all of Kenya. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. they're not doing it domestically. Like right. the, the EU, in part, I think, is doing it because of energy security concerns. They really started to get involved when uh, Russia turned off the pipelines to neighbors, yeah. okay. which so is a good motivator. Let's open it back up um, right here in the front. Uh, Robert Schroeder with International Investor. Uh, First, I, I'm a little bit late, so forgive me if you've already covered it. How, how much or how long is your time horizon in your outlook in the book? And do you offer some economic analysis for the impacts of some of this decision making? Um, I don't offer specific economic impacts, and that goes to the timeline. The problem with the timeline is that in a lot of cases, you, you have two things happening at the same time. You have a slow erosion of the system, a slow inevitable erosion of the system, and you have these one-off extreme events. So if you're looking at a country like Tuvalu, you know, often people use a mathematical type assessment. They say it's six feet above sea level, so if sea level rises six feet, it's going to disappear. That's not actually how it works. Uh, you can get uh, salt water intrusion into groundwater with one big storm. Your freshwater system dies off. Your plants die off. You have no desalination plants. The country has to be evacuated. So you can have really sudden impacts, as we saw with New Orleans or as we saw in, in some of the places in the UK during the floods. Um, so you can say it will definitely have a, a problem by this time, but it may have a problem much, much sooner. And that's what makes the economic analysis, the numbers, kind of difficult. Okay, um, back here. Carl Bridgeway, Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, we've had a project on uh, the energy water nexus, right. and it has been very difficult to get a toehold in the U.S. government to address it. I wonder where you see at least the glimmers of uh, U.S. government agencies addressing the kind of issues you're talking about. That's a great question. It's really difficult. Um, and, 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 and are you including food also? Are you looking at the three water components or just energy water? We started just with energy water to, to get as limited as we can for the, the chance that it could then grow. We know there are many other issues. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I am a consultant to this, to this Global Ease project. Um, it's, it's difficult because this is perceived to be a security issue in many cases. So it goes into the intelligence community. The intelligence community isn't so keen about sharing information because that's their, that's their lifeblood. However, this is such an interdisciplinary and multifaceted issue um, that there aren't many, you know, you can't do it. You can't section it off and not subject it to discussion and peer review. And especially, and I'm not just saying this because I'm Canadian, talking to people from other countries. Okay? So Globalese was created uh, out of the U.S. Department of Energy to have a platform for these sorts of interdisciplinary discussions. It's, it exists mostly online, and it includes experts from several dozen countries to talk about specific initiatives, including the effect of uh, environmental change on energy infrastructure. It is having a hard time surviving. You know, there's not a lot of support for it um, institutionally, even though there's enormous support for it in kind of globally and with governments, other governments as well. And part of it comes down to this little turf war over intelligence. So if you have any suggestions on how to get around this problem, <laughs> we're all, all listening. Although I hear, I, although I hear that uh, 
adaptation may become more of a kind of homeland security type remit. And that might help move things forward. Great. So in the back, the gentleman in the back. Greg Thielman, Arms Control Association. <laughs> You've done a great job uh, laying out the challenges before us and the interrelationship between them. Uh, what I'm left wondering is how one engages uh, the people on Main Street. Uh, it seems like so far, uh, if one uses uh, climate, climate change as an example, the international scientific community has been unusually united and connected to sort of elite uh, political institutions. But the manifestation in the U.S., it seems like what's hot in the U.S. is people on Main Street getting together and having tea parties. And it seems like the, the top of the agenda is not the kind of challenges that you describe. So how does one get, like in the American political context, uh, people advocating uh, higher gasoline taxes or uh, higher water taxes in Las Vegas? It seems so remote from where we are now to confronting any of these challenges. So do you have any political advice for us? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get, well, hold on, I, I forgot my magic wand at home. Um, it's, um, it's a really long process because it's, it isn't one problem, it's a, it's a million problems. So the approach that, that I use uh, is a very local approach. Um, climate change has become extremely hot button political topic, really, really touchy. But if you go to Louisville and you talk to them about their hurricane, ice storm and flood, you know, and then say, well, what are you doing about your zoning regulations? Where's your water supply coming from? The sort of things that you can engage with really effectively locally and get your city government involved. Some of the most useful people are city planners. You know, and they are quite on board with the, our impact on the environment part of the equation. New transportation system, those sorts of things. And once they become more aware of a changing environment's impact on their city, it will be incorporated into planning to a certain degree. So what I do, it's a long process, and it's, uh, you know, it, it involves a lot of travel and work and discussion, but it's very rewarding, is deal a lot at the local level. And then once you see the change that you can affect at the local level, that kind of can start to build, and then you can start to get more momentum for some of the broader state-level things or federal-level things that, that you're talking about. The other thing is that uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of carrot as opposed to stick. So instead of trying to look more towards uh, taxes, try to look more towards tax rebates for good behavior, for example, those sorts of things. Because the, 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 the American pop public is being hit really hard right now. So if it's associated, if these sorts of changes are associated with uh, having to be hit even harder, there will be more resistance. If it's associated with making life a little easier for you, which it should be anyway, then uh, you can start to get a little bit of traction. But obviously that only works in certain areas. I think part of it too is making sure that we keep our media's attention focused on the right narrative. Uh, in today's New York Times, there's an article about the gotcha around climate change science um, and that the uh, scientists, I think this, the thrust of the story was that the scientists are now starting to defend themselves a little bit more openly. Um, uh, that's, but what, if you really look at the science of climate change, the, uh, where the real scientific dissent comes in is not I that climate change isn't happening. It's that the, uh, the consensus right now is too moderate, that climate change is actually coming at us at a much faster rate. That's where the scientific dissent is actually coming from. That's where the conversation is. And, but our media is looking at the gotcha moment um, and is, is to, to a large extent, off track. Um, I think we've got a lot to do in terms of education. I think um, one of the things we're going to try to do here at New America Foundation is, is do more events like this, do more writing, do more um, advocacy to, to have a much more uh, comprehensive view. I mean, how, how many Americans are aware of all these, you know, the, the Montreal ice storm, the UK floods, in addition to Hurricane Katrina, the monsoon drying up a little um, bit of snow in Washington. A little bit of snow in Washington and, and actually understanding that that's um, consistent with uh, a changing climate. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that you know, organizations like ours, like yours, can be doing. Um, question right next to you. Yeah, thanks. And, oh, sorry. Hi, Lisa Hi. Friedman from Climate Wired, and it's great to see you again. Um, 
I was hoping that you could you could pinpoint you know from from everything you've looked at some of the top threats that you think the U.S. should be paying attention to. I mean, threat. What would you say the top threats to the, to the U.S. would be from changing dynamics in other countries? For, you mean a kind of threats that are going to be imported from other countries or domestic threats? Either. Either. Well, domestically, coastlines and water supply. You know, you have a lot of, you have over 50% of the U.S. population living along the coast and a lot of critical infrastructure along the coast. And it's not, it's the same thing as with the two value. It's not just mathematical. You know, you get, I've been, I, I, uh, I much as I love Louisville, coming back to Louisville, um, I was stuck there for a lot longer than expected because of snowstorms in, in Newark. You know, and you, the, the interconnectedness of this economy means that you get these critical nodes going down. And you're going to see that more and more. New York is extremely vulnerable to, to increased disruption. And we've made it an economic hub. So you're going to get, across, you know, you're going to get these economic knock-on effects, no question. Um, and you know, we, through the National Flood Insurance Program, you know, we've put millions of people into locations where they really shouldn't be living. You know, so you're, the whole coastline infrastructure, both from an economic perspective and from a humanitarian perspective, is extremely vulnerable, very problematic. And just to sort of jump to a different location, the same is true in China. You know, China has put most of its uh, <coughs> critical industrial infrastructure all along its east coast, which in many places is like the U.S. Gulf Coast. It's low-lying. It's subject to subsidence. It's in a typhoon pathway. For the past six or seven summers in a row, they have evacuated hundreds of thousands of people every summer out of typhoon pathways. Now, they're very good at it. People go out, but then the people go right back and continue business. It's only a matter of time before you get a really big hit on a city like Shanghai, and that will have global economic repercussions. If it's a big enough hit, it's not unlikely they'd have to sell off some T-bills in order to fund domestic reconstruction, for example. So that sort of this kind of knock-on economic impacts are critical. And water, water supply, as our colleague here can tell you, is a really, really serious issue in a lot of parts of the United States. Sir, right here. What would you identify as resources that would be useful for us and citizens to be able to keep up to date with these issues? And using the regional uh, possibilities as being important. We go back to Katrina just to comment. Please. One year before Katrina, National Geographic published an article that looked like a news release of Katrina. Twelve months in advance, everybody in Louisiana knew they were ready for hell and they were not prepared to do anything. But we could have those situations here or in Florida. How are we going to marshal public opinion to elevate the issues? Is could there could you identify yourself, it? sir, too? That's the question. Could you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Tom Whitley. I'm uh, very active in this issue. <laughs> <Thank you>. Good. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's, we need more people very active in the issue. Uh, it is, uh, local universities are often, I mean, the first thing you want to do if you're dealing, if you're dealing with the local situation is find out what the local situation is. And uh, universities are a good place to start. University scientists love getting a phone call. I mean, they're sitting in their offices uh, dealing with term papers. Nobody talks to them. And, and another issue sort of that, um, that kind of coming back to what you're saying about the, the problem with the science is they need media self-defense courses. Yeah. You know, they don't know how to deal with <laughs> What happened in, with the University of East Anglia was the news broke on like a Friday and uh, they said, oh, this will blow over by Monday. We're not going to put out a press release or anything. It'll, it'll be, you know, by that time, it was totally out of control. Um, so that's a cr critical part of that issue. But um, first, find out what your issues are. And then you, you push your local government. Again, local government is not, um, you know, they're the ones that are going to have to clean up this mess. And in many cases, they're just not aware of the issues. And if you can give them a good enough case, they can go for better funding at the state level or the federal level. You know, you kind of work within the way the existing systems work. Please, mm -hmm. sorry. Do you have a website? Do I have a website? I have a, uh, well, I have the, if you, if you uh, the book has a website. If you go to globalwarring.com, very clever, right? Um, then that, that'll get you to me. 
So if you if you want to follow through in anything, yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Great. Some more questions um, right here, sir. Um, Bob Means, uh, Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland. Um, if we just somewhat unrealistically stay within a rational decision-making model, uh, the problems, or the two major problems are externalities and a mismatch between the electoral cycle and the, and the time frame. The place where you would then expect prob to get rational decisions would be an institution that internalizes the burden and is used to making long-term decisions. Duke Power, let us say, is placing a new coal plant on a, on a river. Do you find that in that kind of context, which is about as good as you're going to get for rational uh, decision making, Duke or the Southern Company takes account of these risks of variations in water availability for their new coal or nuclear plants? Uh oh. <laughs> um, some do it better than others. And the two other, I mean, you, you pinpoint the, the critical question, which is who is incorporating long term planning? And there are two areas that are very helpful, actually, the, the military, which, yeah, and the insurance industry. So, you know, if you talk to Duke's insurance industry, insurance provider, and say, you know, look, this plant may not be able to generate, then that may change their financial model, right? So working with insurance can be very helpful in guiding appropriate decision making if there's no political interference. Right? Because then you get into this other thing you're talking about, which is the short-term electoral cycle. So you know, the local congressperson may really want that plant right now in order to get in jobs for the, next, for the election that's coming up. And so they will put in some sort of, like that's how the National Flood Insurance Program essentially works. So if, if you're dealing with rational market forces and elements that have kind of a long-term perspective built in, that can be very helpful. But often, you get this political interference, which undermines the problem as well. However, just, just a, on a positive note, there was, just in the paper last week, uh, there's a there was a proposed nuclear plant in Utah, which, was, which has not been approved because they couldn't secure water rights. So it's starting to be discussed. There's another possible solution or pathway out of that. Is if you've got, a, say, an administration that is aware of, this, of the challenge, but needs some type of political incentive to actually implement and take the risk to do something as large as at the scale that we're talking about. And that's kind of why we're calling the work that we're going to be doing grand strategy. It's really, really big. Um, then you need to find that domestic constituency that would benefit from this and help drive or, or, or underwrite a new political consensus in the United States, the same way that uh, first Truman, then Eisenhower, developed a durable political consensus around containment. There was a, a situation awareness, but then we also recognized that there was a great, um, there was there was an economic engine that could lead to domestic prosperity, that could power, um, uh, that could that could back up that strategic consensus. My sense is that there's one statistic, and behind which there could be that the, the beginning of that consensus, and it happens to be that 46 percent of Americans don't like where they live. They're not happy. Um, if that's the case, if you have 46% of the American people um, who would rather be living somewhere else, and suburbia, is prob suburbia and urban blight are probably the two reasons why they're not happy where, they're, where they are. And it just so happens that suburban infrastructure and urban infrastructure are two of the culprits that we need to change. Um, you may have the foundation for uh, a new economic engine that more or less, and this is what we're going to explore, could recycle suburbia, could recycle that urban blight. Um, and in the process of rebuilding the connections between our urban areas, our rural areas, our agricultural areas, our energy infrastructure, you have enough to have the solution to the challenge not be a matter of cost, but the solution to the challenge be a, be a function, be um, have a prosperity function to it. Um, so anyways, that's, I think, where I'm excited about exploring. That's where we're going to go with this grant strategy initiative, is that you've got to make it so that within, say, an eight-year time frame, now potentially a seven-year time frame, you can make it, um, you can show that there's a political um, uh, benefit by essentially reorienting the American economic engine towards um, some type of prosperity essentially a source of demand that can power the United States through this problem. 
Um, if we can do that, then I think that in terms of what I'm seeing, that's the only way we're going to get around, around the, the, the rational actor problem that, you're, that you identified. But I don't know what, if you respond to that or we can take another well, question. Well, I think it's, I, it's really important, but you don't want to move them all to Miami. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of the, the impact. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, and it, you know, the the um, the what you're talking about is the really critical our impact on the environment component and an energy security component and all that sort of stuff. And what we really what we want to do is integrate that essential component into an assessment of a changing environment's impact on us. Exactly. And then if we can combine Sorry. those two streams, mm -hmm. we'll we'll be in pretty good shape. Um, what you're seeing um, in a place like China, for example, just on the first half of the equation, kind of the R impact and the environment alternative um, uh, energy system, those sorts of things. I mean, China has proven this can be f phenomenally economically beneficial in, term in the way that they've ramped up their solar production, solar panel sure. production really quickly. We've been really slow to compete on that front. Mm -hmm. um, it's been very successful. So we know, you know, we can... There's money to be made, and yeah, there's stability exactly, to be gained. Exactly. Um, and if we can combine it with a smart defensive strategy, if we don't put our cities like Shanghai right on the coast, then in 20, 30, 40 years, as other countries start to have really serious problems, we'll be in a much more stable position. Right. right. And I think the, the story of China right now is that China's real um, GDP growth is driven today by building China, yeah. not by its export strategy. And that's what, and and if it's, if that's the same story from the United States after World War II, it was the boom was caused by building America. Yeah. Um, if that's the pattern, if that's where you get large scale economic growth, then we've got a very large potentially pool of demand here in the United States for rebuilding America. Um, China, and then to the extent that you can have price signals flow out from that, yeah. that prioritize that kind of rebuilding, we're going to be in better shape. But, that's right. um, yeah, I mean, it would have been great to see more more of the um, uh, kind of post-financial crisis money going going towards exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. I mean, in a lot of cases, that money went to build infrastructure in the same location where it already exists. Exactly. The same type of infrastructure in the same location it already exists. And that's, uh, that's actually dangerous yeah. Yeah. in terms of long-term yeah. stability. And here at New America, we've had both Joe Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winning economist, say more or less the same thing. Yeah. Um, that you need to orient that restructuring of the financial system around some type of strategic goal, and we're not doing that. Right. Um, and uh, George Soros saying the same thing, that the, the big source of kind of economic opportunity for the United States is really dealing, addressing climate change, and I think we'd both argue environmental change in addition to climate change. That's right. Uh, and there, and there, there are potential enormous soft power benefits as well. I mean, if the U.S. becomes a leader in adaptive techniques and technologies, you know, how do you protect coastlines? How do you protect your freshwater supplies? Those sorts of things. You know, China in Africa, for example, is basically building 1950s style infrastructure. It's going to have problems as the environment in Africa changes. And, you know, we can't compete with China in that sphere. But if we're offering smarter infrastructure, you know, more adaptive infrastructure, then it can become an interesting soft power type mm -hmm. way of building friendships and alliances in a time that will become very difficult and we'll need more friendship mm -hmm. and alliances. And indeed, Europe was looking at this in their, their recent Mediterranean summit, I think two years ago, where they <laughs> proposed, Gordon Brown and, and um, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, proposed the creation of a Saharan solar energy field that would power both North Africa, some of Sub-Saharan Africa, but also send uh, power up on uh, high, um, high capacity transmission lines up into Europe. Um, and looking at those types of options where you've got sophisticated new technology that is survivable um, uh, and that can also deal with the carbon footprint, I think that's probably the way to go. Yeah. And, and you know, in the United States' context, we ought to be looking to the Western Hemisphere for those relationships. And instead, it's tar sands, um, no offense, uh, <laughs> uh, but or nothing in terms of Latin America. Um, we're just not engaging. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of opportunity for strategic innovation there. Um, we'll take a couple more questions from the field. Uh, yeah, in the back. Um, hi, Martin Walker. Um, you clear you're, you're advising us not to do 
the new city building on the coast. And you're also advising us that Las Vegas is not a great idea and much of the southwest is not a great idea because of water shortages. I'm also picking up from your talk about flood that we'd better not build them in the Mississippi Valley or the Missouri Valley or the Ohio Valley, which means I think that the Great Lakes is going to be the place to be. And you're being a Canadian, obviously, Toronto real estate is going to do great. Are you I'm from Buffalo should, originally. Are well, you saying so we should yeah. all start investing in real estate in Detroit? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. The, the new boom town. Yeah. No, I, well, but those are those are those are serious issues. I mean, you sort of got to uh, got to the crux of it, and especially if you combine it with access to hydropower, for example. So if you're up in the Northeast, I mean, you don't have to go to Detroit. You can go to New Hampshire, or, you know, somewhere like that. But the Asian carp are about to eat all the fish. Really That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, but but those Ooh. sorts of assessments, you know, if you're looking for business continuity, if you're looking for the possibility for, for, you know, if you are redesigning, then you want to make sure that some of those elements are in place, those water supply, food supply, those sorts of things. Has, has anybody actually tried to do that and tried to look at uh, what the design, of the architecture, the industrial architecture of a redesigned, rational, adaptive U.S. or North America would look like? In the Not that I know of. They're, they're, ha they're on, on the our impact on the environment front, you know, a sort of the low carbon economy type approach. There has been quite a bit of research, N not necessarily on the siting of those low carbon uh, pieces of infrastructure. Yeah, land use. You'll notice if you if you if you pay attention to the carbon to the carbon or the climate change conversation, land use is really not part of the conversation right now. Um, it is another one of these third rails out there. I think owing to the fact of that developers, um, ho uh, home builders are such a major part of, of, uh, of local political campaigns. Um, and they have an enormous um, say in, in uh, what is talked about on, on Capitol Hill. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a third rail issue that we need to start getting around. Um, and, and there's a lot of people who are already preparing, I think you saw this in, in uh, the American Northwest, around eminent domain, that there's a real issue, Connecticut as well, can, be, because of these issues, because of these kind of re redesigns, there's going to be a real challenge around um, the, the public use of private property. Um, and to the extent, it, and, and there's already, I think, some defensive positions being taken um, around uh, some of the, the bastions of smart growth in, in, in Oregon, in Portland, Seattle. Um, and I think we're seeing some of the battle lines starting to be drawn, but we haven't gotten there yet, uh, to my knowledge, Martin, on, on a real design for what this would look like. Um, OK, another couple questions. Um, right here, gentlemen. And then behind him, and then right there. Yeah, uh, Chen, freelance correspondent. How much does the war contribute to the environment and uh, uh, climate change? How and much does the, war? And we just want to kind of collect questions. <coughs> yes, I have two more questions. All right. Canada is a mineral-rich country. Uh, does uh, their mining and uh, the manufacture of metal, how much do they contribute to the environment and climate change? And uh, you talk about China, the building corrupt. I think maybe they use the groundwater uh, could be one of factor. Uh, do you know how the city in the world, uh, in general, how they use the groundwater? Let's collect them, actually. So uh, right behind. Yep. Uh. Katrina Schwartz from the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Um, my question is, your, the title of your book is called Global Warring, which is a provocative title. And a lot of what you've talked about is domestic infrastructure, et cetera, and the effects, of environmental effects on the US, which I think is good because people aren't really talking about that. But how might that interact with the more international perspective You know, when we talk about threat multipliers and instability and you know migration and things like that um, and and what sort of conflict might you predict coming from the, the interaction between both the domestic effects and the international ones great and then one final one oh, right here. I'm gonna have to start writing things down. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I'm trying to capture them too and my, my name is Jerry Richmond and following up the, the previous questioner talked about migration and the other gentleman talked about 
know, real estate in the Great Lakes. Historically, is there, has there been a historic timeline that tracks how human beings actually do migrate in response to environmental change? I mean, we can buy real estate in the Great Lakes, but we can't all move there because there's not enough room. And I'm just wondering if there's been sort of, a, if there's any sort of studies that show whether that's a, a steady type of movement or, or different types of environmental changes trigger uh, different speeds of, of migration, and are we in a period of time uh, where, where there may be new ingredients that might um, make prior historical formulas obsolete? Okay. So war, minerals, subsidence in China, um, um, little, little global pickish. warring, and That's then um, uh, the, the military, military operations consume an enormous amount of power and have a very high emissions footprint. And, uh, and you see it, I mean, I can't remember the numbers, but they're enormous. To get, if you want to get a tank of gas to the front line, it takes many, many tanks of gas to transport that tank of gas. To it's the, $400 a gallon yeah, is so the effective price for gas for the U.S. military in Iraq. That's right. So, uh, so just in terms of energy usage, there's enormous energy usage, but then, of course, there's huge environmental destruction. And you're bringing a lot of, if you're looking at a place like Afghanistan, which is water poor, and you're bringing in hundreds of thousands of very thirsty outside people, it has an impact. And it, and it has a knock-on effect as well in terms of what you can grow agriculturally and, and those sorts of issues. So sort of environmental change in war zones is, is a very serious issue. Canada is a huge emitter. Uh, the, the oil sands, I'm Canadian, so I have to say oil sands. The oil sands um, <laughs> al alone uh, sort of boosts our per capita emissions tremendously. The uh, mineral exploitation sometimes maybe not so much, but we are, we are definitely a big emitter. In terms of groundwater, that's a really interesting question because uh, for Chinese coastal cities, there is a lot of reliance on, on groundwater. But as you get sea level rise, that salt water can, can contaminate, can get in and contaminate the uh, groundwater. And you're starting to see unexpected shifts in underground river systems. So there's, every now and then you'll see a news story out of Shanghai where they're building a new metro and they'll tunnel into a pocket of water. Now, and, and sadly the construction workers die. Now that means that they've lost the mapping ability for the underground systems, water systems under Shanghai. They're moving so much. It's, a, it's an active delta. And these are very good engineers. These are some of the best in the world. And there, it's still difficult to maintain that sort of hold on where the water supply is. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. We're seeing it in China graphically, but it's a challenge globally for any coastal community as well. Um, in terms of migration and, uh, and, and wars, um, we're, we're entering a period where you're starting to see a lot more proxy type wars than direct wars. So uh, you'll, I expect you to see a lot more conflict in places like Africa around securing of resources, like even just uranium, if we're starting to shift to a new, um, a new low, well, a new economy based on nuclear power. But that won't be, you know, China against the U.S. in the Pacific. That might be various factions within Africa who are backed by outside forces, that sort of thing. And you can start to see it at play already in Asia with a lot of these kind of proxy conflicts, these sublateral relations, those sorts of things. Um, I don't think India and China is going to go to war. You know, I think they're too, way too interconnected on too many issues. You might see big proxy strikes, you know, through Pakistan, you know, from China through Pakistan onto India or through potentially Tibetans. Into, you know, you might start to see that sort of thing. But I would, I would hope that the time of big engagement of, of that sort between major powers is waning. I wouldn't put all of my money on it. <laughs> right? um, there are a lot of other factors at play, but I think at least in the next five years, the sort of thing that you're going to start to see is this increase of proxy tensions related to resource issues. And, and knock on domestic issues. You know, If the US cuts off whatever little water supply is going down into Mexico now, that will increase tensions within Mexico over water supplies, for example. So, you know, who do you blame that, that one on? In terms of uh, migration, and I'll get back to sort of your migration issue, you tend to see there's a, there's a good academic work on the relationship between specific events and migration or conflict. 
Um, I mean, the big, big one is is the uh, is what populated Canada originally, which which was you know the big ice sheets. So the populations of um, sort of northern China, Siberia, just followed the food across the Bering Strait and into Canada. That was essentially kind of a, their, their climate shifted, and they needed to follow their food supply. So you you have a really interesting body of study around it. Um, a lot of it is interrelated with conflict. So when you get a time of resource scarcity, you're, you're more likely to get the sort of conflict, and the conflict itself can affect access to resources, which can create refugee issues as well. So there, you know, it's, I'm, from my point of view, it's not pr so productive to, to, to disconnect the issues, uh, because I'm looking at just trying to deal with cohesive impacts. But there is a, there's a lot of interesting study on it. Just to follow up on one point, I think what we're seeing now in the little surge of diplomacy between India and Pakistan is really telling. Um, I think it was over the weekend, uh, India's Prime Minister Manmohan Singh visited Saudi Arabia um, in a bid to get Saudi Arabia to put leverage over Pakistan to get make sure that Pakistan kind of stays at a table and deals with this, um, deals with the India Pakist Pakistan issue, which will hopefully then un unwind Afghanistan. I think India recognizes that its long-term strategic future is going to be based on a peaceful frontier with Pakistan. Um, and I think it's getting to a lot of these issues around water, um, around long-term um, access to energy that, um, that is in India's long-term interest. They've kind of woken up and they realized, oh, we can't have a belligerent nature, um, nation or com real strong competitor to our north and have somebody um, spawning uh, terrorist activities that could destabilize the entire country or lead to a nuclear war right next door. I think they've, I think, I'm hoping they've gotten the message. Um, and it seems like, um, you know, there's been some shuttle diplomacy on the part of Washington that has helped that out. But I think largely, I think it's been a strategic decision. And you, you live in India, so maybe if you could give us a little more insight. Yeah, I mean, a, a caveat to their will not be war answer uh, <laughs> is, uh, is actually not so much the, the the, the western border with India, but the, the eastern border, which is Bangladesh. And when we're talking, the, the UN is predicting 10 to 20 million refugees mm -hmm. coming out of Bangladesh, and India will not absorb that amount of people. So they're building a wall around Bangladesh now. And if, if there is a, an attempt at large-scale influx, then you may see some very strong defensive action, if I can, if I can put it that way, just to try to discourage put it that way, the refugees coming across the border. So you might, you might see that. They can't, India just can't take in you know, several million Bangladeshi refugees. A lot of them have passed through refugee camps. There's been a radicalization process supported by Pakistan. They, they, they're, they're networks within the country that are already not so supportive of the Indian government. So they, they just, because of these other geopolitical issues and domestic issues, they're going to need to keep that border relatively sealed. And there's n nowhere else for these refugees to go. So that's a, real, that's a time bomb. That one's a bad one. I don't, and I don't know how that one's going to play out. Well, there's global warring. There's yeah. the, <laughs> um, on that kind of somber note, um, <laughs> sure. um, I, think it's, I think it's exactly the, the right note we right. need to be striking right now and to wake people up. So thank you, Cleo. Um, thank you for coming. A thank round you. of applause. Thanks for having me. <laughs> real pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and I think there, there are books for sale out back around.